Hi, welcome to History Talks. I'm your host, Will, and this is Sebastian. Today, we're going to be talking about the scientific revolution. So, Sebastian, can you tell us what led up to the scientific revolution? Well, the first thing we need to know is the Renaissance, you know, because uh, the, first, uh, scientific, the first scientific revolution the person is Copernicus, who starts in Poland, and then Galileo is in Italy. So, before you have these guys, you have the Renaissance and you have the Reformation. The Renaissance, you know, they're thinking about, like, oh, we can bring back these old classical Greek, Greco-Roman, Hellenistic, whatever you want to do, call it, ideas that are all the way from the classical era, you know? And some people consider that, you know, like, a step forward from, like, the setback of the Middle Ages. Mm. You can yeah. consider it however you want, but... Okay, well, let me just stop you there. So there, there were people who were thinking that the scientific revolution um, was sort of a continuation of an earlier era of knowledge. Or, or they were they were building up that. They were building, they, were, they wanted to take that knowledge and bring it into a different era. Uh, that certainly might have been part of what inspired it, but here's the thing about the scientific revolution. It's that, while well, during the Renaissance, they were thinking, okay, well, we can take this classical knowledge, bring it back, and then use that to rebuild, you know, philosophy and thought. Okay. During the scientific revolution, they're starting to consider, but wait, what if these ancient Greco-Roman sources or whatever are not perfect? Mm -hmm. What if there are flaws in, say, the writings of Aristotle? And part of this is traceable to, you know, the Reformation, you know? Uh, during the Renaissance, the Church started, you know, teach based off of the Aristotle stuff. Okay. Uh, Reformation, you know, some people are, are thinking, hey, you know, you can actually question the Roman Catholic Church, and some people might actually accept your ideas. So, so scientific revolution it is where it culminates. You have this guy called Copernicus. Mm -hmm. He's from Poland, I believe. Hmm. And he says that the Earth revolves around the sun. Okay. Now, he doesn't go into that much detail, if I recall. He made some astronomical observations, and... But his... Right, he had a reason for believing that, right? Yeah. He had done some sort of calculation. Was it, was it mathematical, or was it observational? Like, he'd been um, looking at things through a telescope and had determined that this was likely how things worked? Um, I believe it was a mixture of the two. Okay. As, as you'll see with a lot of people looking at astronomy, you have to mix both observation and math to draw your conclusions. That makes sense. Yeah. So Copernicus releases this work, and it's not that well received, but, you know, it's also oh, not suppressed into obscurity, you know. Okay. At least one person read it. Okay. And that at least one person is an Italian dude named Galileo Galilei. Okay. So Galileo was influenced by Copernicus's work. Yeah. Okay. He looked at Copernicus's work. And what year are we talking about at this point? So we're talking like late 1500s. Late 1500s, okay. Yeah. So late 1500s, Copernicus publishes his, his view, his hypothesis that the Earth uh, revolves around the sun. And then Galileo... Which well, did, did Copernicus take that any further? Or did he, uh, he, he just wrote it and maybe it was something that may have been read within the scientific community but not really noticed outside of that? Yeah. That okay? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Okay. So then when we get into more of the 1600s is when Galileo starts to pop up. And okay. and what does Galileo do with it? Um, he looks at it and he's like, yeah, this conclusion kind of ma makes sense. I'm going to do some further observation. Okay. So then he, so then he publishes this work that's talking about, you know, um, you know, whether the Earth or the Sun revolved around each other, whether Ptolemy was right. Because okay. Ptolemy was a ancient Greek guy who said mm -hmm. that the Sun revolved around the Earth. Okay. And Aristotle um, had this theory that was widely accepted at the time, mm -hmm. um, that you had the Earth at the center, mm -hmm. and then each of the planets mm -hmm. uh, was in a sphere. Like the, mm -hmm. so, like the universe was an onion, and in each of those spheres was a different part of the heavens. Okay. Rather than an elliptical orbit, he thought it was perfectly spherical. Yeah, per okay. Yeah. So Galileo does some calculations. He, he figures stuff out like, you know, elliptical orbit. Mm -hmm. He brings his publishing things to the church, mm -hmm. though Rome uh, dismisses it, it on account of uh, two things. Mm -hmm. One, it 
or they dismiss it namely off of, like, you know, he failed to account for the parallax of the stars, because, you know, most people believe that back then that the universe could not possibly be that big. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that the universe isn't that big, then this, then this proper mathematical property called parallax says that the star, that the Earth has to not be moving in order for the stars to make any sense. Right, and the concept of parallax is where if I see two objects, one is further away and I'm moving, the one that um, is further away will appear to be moving faster. Is that correct? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let's let's say I have let's say I'm I'm in a car driving and there's a tree that's close to me, but there is. Or, or I take that back. When I said the one that's further away will appear to be moving faster, it's the opposite. Right. The one that's mm -hmm. closer appears to be moving faster. So I I got that backwards. So I'm I'm in a car. I'm driving down a road, and I see a tree on the side of the road that's say 100 feet away, yeah. and then there's a field behind that. Behind that field, there's more trees that are, you know, half a mile away. So when I look out in, in my visual view there, the, the, um, the trees up in the distance will appear to move more slowly, whereas the ones, the one closer will be, the trees closer will be moving by more rapidly. And that's the parallax effect. And that was how, um, that was how um, it was Ptolemy and maybe the church at the time was viewing that you know that's how they came up with their model right yeah. they were looking at that they were looking at the motions of the stars and calculating based off of that so they it wasn't just something random they had an actual method they were using to calculate it so then galileo came up based off copernicus's research mm -hmm. and said hmm no i have a different idea a completely different idea so the church's response is well then how do you explain the parallax effect yeah right and then and then what happened next uh they they use this and also a philosophical component. You know, okay. they believe that the Ptolemaic model seemed more perfect and therefore more godly. Okay. Uh, so based off of those two factors, they tell Galileo, "Look, I your your work is wrong. So please stop teaching it. You know, just recant and you'll be fine." And Galileo's like, "All right, I'll recant." Okay. So then Galileo goes back, but then like a few years later, he writes a new book called on the, the orbits of the celestial spheres, where he talked about both th theories and the evidence for both. Oh, okay. And it seems like he's leaning towards the... Um, I see, he presents, he presents what uh, arguments for and against each one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it seems like he's leaning towards the Copernican theory, and the church is like, no, it's, I, we're still not convinced. Okay. But in some places, um, people are starting to think, you know, Hmm, maybe there is more merit to this idea. Hmm. So then you start to get people like a certain Danish man named Tycho Brahe. Okay. Now Brahe comes after Galileo, and he's like, all right, I'm going to make my own astronomical observations. Wait, can I stop you for a second there? So when Galileo publishes his, uh, what was the, the book he published, or the treatise he published where he compared the for and against for both the the parallax model on the, on the orbits of the celestial okay, spheres. So that, did anything come of that? Um, it starts. Or it is starts this, or is this just like, open it up where we say, well, we need to determine what the what the truth. Yeah, is. this kind of opens it up because okay. now people are thinking, oh, all right, what is the answer? Because now I'm confused. Okay. Yeah. So when he recanted before, maybe that was an insincere recant. Maybe he was. He was biding his time, or maybe he really did re believe uh, what he was doing when he recanted and then simply got new information later. We don't know, do we? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so he publishes this. Tycho Brahe reads it, and what does is, what is Tycho Brahe do? He's like, all right, I'm going to make my own observations to figure out what the truth is. Okay. So he comes up with a model that sounds ridiculous, especially to our modern ears, but becomes the accepted model for some time. Okay. So he says, okay, I'm observing these planets, and it's seeming more and more like they're revolving around the sun, you know, Venus, Mercury, whatever, they're revolving around the sun, but I still, but there's still the parallax thing. So his model says that the Earth is at the center, then the sun revolves around the Earth, and then all of the other planets revolve around the sun. Mm, okay. It, it sounds just a little ridiculous, and it looks a little ridiculous, but it becomes the accepted model by the general scientific community for a time. Okay. Um, and how did he prove that? 
Um, he he made like a ton of observations. Like he he just spends so much time in his lab making observations okay, and so doing mathematical ca- calculations yeah. that even uh, modern scientists are saying, yeah, his math was right. He just drew the wrong conclusion from his math. Okay, and, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and you could certainly do that when you when you do mathematical proofs. You could prove all sorts of things that actually math add up. You could find a logical explanation for something, even if the logic actually. The logic may be correct, but it may actually lead you to the wrong um, result, or the wrong, it may not. It may lead you away from the truth. But that, which is an interesting yeah. lesson, I think about um, I think about math and science. Um, so, but part of the scientific method is that yeah. people look at it and they say, well, let's go through and evaluate this and see if this logic, which is the logic is correct, actually leads us to the truth. So, so what happens from there? You said it was so, accepted for a while, so then. Were people happy with this, or were there people who said, no, this this can't be right? I mean, if we go back to Galileo, that also starts off an explosion in other ways. Because okay. you mentioned the scientific method. Yes. This is where that gets invented. Because okay. there's an English man named Francis Bacon. Okay. You may have heard of him. Okay. Um, he was a navigator and a scientist. And okay. he creates what we now call the scientific method. You know, okay. the process of forming a hypothesis, testing it, and getting it peer review. Okay, and what time period are we talking about now? So this is, so, um, Francis Bacon is like shortly after Galileo. Okay, okay. Shortly after, so what, early 1500s, mid 1500s? Uh, like late 1500s. Late 1500s, okay, so late 1500s, uh, Francis Bacon comes around and Vince er- officially standardizes it. Um, I'm guessing there were other people who had been working on something, but he, he actually standardizes it. Does he call it the scientific? Uh, process or give it some sort of name like that. As I recall, okay, so yeah, he, he was standardize it, gives it this name, and, and actually, and like, it, do? it says you you take you're going to take observational evidence, you're going to apply that, and then you're going to create the system where you use evaluations, you about use that evidence to evaluate and write at the truth, whereas anyone else can come in and say I have you know either this evidence is wrong or I have evidence that leads. To another conclusion and question it right was, yeah that was okay so he did that yeah. late 1500s and then what what did he do with it did he um did he just contribute the process or did he do scientific inquiry applying that process uh he tried some scientific inquiry though his experiments weren't that um you know useful in the long term yeah. like he actually died trying to do some experiments involving freezing a chicken hmm. or rather shoveling ice into a chicken yeah Hmm, okay. And uh, yeah, what was that supposed to prove? You could, I don't know. You could, you could freeze the chicken and then maybe thaw it out and, and it would be alive later or something like that. Um, but anyway, okay, so he ran it, he, in his own experimental um, efforts, he ran into some dead ends, but he did contribute a, pro- a formalized process, which is still used today, right? Yeah. We still use the same process. Okay, so, so what, what happened? So would you say that is the point? At which the scientific revolution begins? I'd, I'd say it sort of begins with Copernicus and then yeah. and then after Galileo and Bacon is where it really takes off. Okay, it begins with Copernicus. He set the wheels in motion. He set the gears in motion there, right? Okay, so um, okay, so so what happens after Bacon? Bacon right. does it. Bacon is, is trying to shovel uh, ice into or snow into to what chickens okay so yeah. he, did, he comes up with a great process but doesn't really uh discover anything yeah too important so so but what who who does though so there must be other people out there who say hey this is a nice process yeah. let's use this what can we do with it uh most notably isaac newton okay. isaac newton comes around about this he's uh, mid 1600s and it's not just newton there's a lot of people but newton is the one that's most remembered okay. um he does a few things. One, he does some really key investigations into the properties of light. Like, he discovers that, you know, not only can you refract light by showing it into a prism, but if you refocus, you know, the rainbow that comes out, you can put it back into another prism, and that will turn it back into white light. Okay. Um, which just shows, you know, how inherent the color of the light is to the light itself. Okay. He's also, you know, the father of calculus, um, and makes a whole bunch of math proofs and stuff, and, you know, invents the area formula for circles. Okay. And, you know, you, and, you know, a lot of physics is uh, built off of Newtonian physics, you know, 
uh, Newton's three laws of physics. Right. Okay. So and how how did he arrive at those? That was uh, that was done through uh, experimental gathering experimental data. Yeah. Okay. And, and you come to conclusions about what the what the cause or not necessarily the causes. He didn't necessarily uh, discover the cause, but he did discover um, equations that could predict what would happen. Right? Yeah. Is that correct? He he created a you you can um, write an equation that says if I drop an apple mm -hmm. from if I stand up on top of a ladder and drop an apple, I can um, use a mathematical equation to calculate how long it will take to hit the ground, how fast it will go. How, you know how, how fast it will accelerate, mm -hmm. what its velocity will be, right? Yeah. He doesn't explain why that happens. We don't know why gravity exists based on yeah. the explanation, but we can predict what is going to happen when yeah. you drop something. Yeah. And with gravity, you know, I don't think he ever really claimed to be, you know, the inventor of gravity. He might have been, but what he does the do with oh, you mean the concept of gravity? Yeah. Okay. But you know. But what he does do with gravity that is actually interesting is he look is he uses this to kind of, of investigate more into this idea of elliptical orbits of planets mm. uh, because he notes hey you know actually the way orbiting works you know if you have this idea of gravity then the way orbits work you know makes more sense except even more so if you have like these elliptical orbits. Mm. You know, so he yeah. applies physics to astronomy in that way. Okay. You know, and there's a bunch of other people, you know, I could go into Vesalius and all these other people. Though I think this is a good point to transition into the more philosophical side right. of the scientific right. revolution. Leibniz was working on calculus at the same time as Newton, for yeah. example. I don't know if you've looked into that, but yeah, okay, so let's let's go into the next um what's the next phase? What happens after this? So also so, so we have, I mean, before that, he, yeah, he didn't invent gravity. People knew gravity existed. They knew, for example, if I throw something up, it's going to come yeah. down. What he did is he said, here, I'm going to write a mathematical equation that is going to predict, and, and, and he says, not just predict, it's very, going to very accurately and repeatedly predict what will happen if I throw something up. Yeah. Okay. So he does that. So then, so yeah, what comes next after that? So at the same so at the same time as all this, you have philosophers such as Rene Descartes. Now Descartes was, you know, in some respects a mathematician, you know, he's the guy who invented, you know, XY coordinates and stuff. But Descartes is most known for Cartesian philosophy and deism. Because okay. he, you know, he's looking at all of this scientific revolution and stuff and is like, you know, why don't we, you know, apply this to philosophy? Because, yeah. you know, I he's so from Descartes' perspective, you know, you have you have all these facts and what seems to be alternative facts, you know, mm -hmm. you may have heard one thing from the preset church earlier, but you may have heard another thing from Newton, and maybe they start, they're saying the same thing, but maybe they're saying different things. Okay. So Descartes is like, ugh, I, I can't be sure of anything anymore. Okay. So he says, all right, we're, enough with all this philosophy we have built up from all these thousands of years. This is getting confusing. Let's just go back, clean the slate, back to square one. Do I even exist? Okay. And he said, well, one cannot doubt one's own existence while still doubting. I cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Okay. So he, so he builds from this to create a new, new philosophical idea of, you know, not just relying on, you know, looking at the ancient Greeks, the ancient biblical classics for your uh, source of philosophical knowledge mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, using more like what you're learning from science and what you're learning from, you know, thought independent of all these other sources to okay. create your philosophy from the ground up. Okay. So he starts the Cartesian school of philosophy. Okay. And he is also the founder of deism. Okay. Um, and around what year is this happening? So Descartes is from around the same era as Newton, I want to say. Okay. So what are we in? Late 1500s? Uh, yeah, or we're going early yeah. 1600s. Yeah, or Descartes. Descartes is like like Descartes is late 1500s, okay. going to 1600s. You know. Okay. Um, and you know, other people are starting to be inspired by him. Like you have Baruch Spinoza. You know. Mm -hmm. Right. Spinoza, you know, he was kind of ostracized. He, he grew up in a Jewish community. He was ostracized from it for refusing to participate in religious rituals. Mm -hmm. um, 
he comes up with ideas like, you know, maybe you don't have a transcendent deity, you know, or maybe your soul is inherently immortal. Mm. And if I recall, uh, don't quote me on this, if I recall, he would eventually become Catholic by the end of his life. Mm. Uh, Spinoza, you know, he's also like a similar school of thought to Descartes. Okay. And how did Descartes end? Atheist? Atheist? Uh, Deist. Deist, okay. Um, with deism, and then and how did this is this is a little bit off topic here, but we can we can say since you think deism is essentially um, what he wanted to do was he was not happy with the Western philosophical traditions and wanted to like you said start over mm-hmm. by applying a scientific model. Um, what did did that um, or I, I guess I should say this. Did that have any influence on the um, the revolutions that occurred in the next century, for example, in America or in France? Um, people say people would uh, most historians would say he almost certainly had a big influence on the Enlightenment in particular, okay. and then that would direct more directly influence the revolution. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. A lot of that seems to be to be based on that. So this this really started sort of as an intellectual movement, and actually yeah. went. And actually had um, was involved in in um, in actual um, revolutionary governments and, and you know wars to to overthrow um, established orders. Um, so okay, so here's here's a question then. So the deism, do you do you think did that advance knowledge any in any way, or was he essentially just saying we have something that's pretty good? That we've been working at it may not be perfect, but we've been working on this for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And he says, "I just want to start over, throw it all out, start over." Is that was that um, did that cause civilization to progress any? Did it go back? Did it go sideways? It's hard to say. You know, one of the, these are topics where you can go endlessly into like you know the pros of stuff like this, the cons of stuff like this. You okay. know. How this, um, so it's a good answer. I mean, I don't think what what he did was really anything new. Maybe he, he put a new label on it, right? There are always people, and there's still people, there's always going to be people who say, oh, you know, everything is wrong. Everything we've been doing for thousands of years is wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, I have this new system. I'm going to apply something new and and just we'll start over because because I have all this knowledge that people in the past didn't have you know mm-hmm. that's that 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 occurs you can see that occurs throughout history you mm-hmm. know and um and and that's what I was just curious if you had a view on that you know because pe- yeah people do have have different views on that but um yeah okay so so D so we get into philosophy from yeah from so I mean it starts with scientific inquiry and to you know, viewing the stars and trying yeah. to figure out the solar system mm-hmm. and, and their paths and, and you know, is it, should, do we use the parallax effects to calculate it or do we use these other things where we're using mathematics to calculate um, uh, planets r- revolving around the sun in mm-hmm. these spherical or elliptical patterns and then trying to calculate and then people are tr- using mathematical equations to be able to explain recurring phenomena in the world. So we get to that and we get to some somebody says, oh, I'll take this and apply it to philosophy. So that's that's kind of a branch of it. But in terms of just the pure science, mm-hmm. what happens next? We have we have um, Francis Bacon comes up with his um, his scientific method, mm-hmm. and then and then where do we go from there? Where do we we now have Newton's uh, mathematics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where do we go from there? What happens next? So um, you know, you have these people, you know. Oh, these people are just coming up with, you know, science, you know, people are starting to get more into science, mm-hmm. um, like even on a, just a more general populist level, um, and, you know, some people are using this, like, you know, say, oh, well, look how advanced the Protestant countries are becoming, or whatever, mm-hmm. and, some peop- and some people are like, you know, you know, maybe we should just slow down, and some people are like, you know, maybe we should, you know, encourage so this. It was the Protestant countries that were advancing more rapidly. It's in some senses, but then you get to France. Okay, yeah, I mean, Francis, Francis Bacon was English, right? Was he Anglican? Uh, 
I believe so. Okay. Yeah, and then that's a whole other debate. You know, where you, where yeah. you get into is Anglicanism <laughs> is it is it Anglo Catholic or is it Protestant? So um, and then you know some people will say it's both. Right? Yeah. And both Catholic and Protestant, but okay. So we have we have that which is where the scientific revolution or the scientific method mm-hmm. is invented. Mm-hmm. Then, but is it is it something where you have Protestant versus um, Catholic countries? Do you have any distinction where one is is advancing more rapidly than the other, and does it have anything to do with religion? Um, people certainly tend it to religion, you know, if people are saying, oh, well, if Luther says you can interpret the Bible however you want, then, you know, maybe these people who can interpret things however they want can use this to look to more scientific inquiry. Okay. But then France uh, jumps into the scientific revolution, you know. Okay. They create, you know, the, the Royal Academy of Sciences, mm. um, and they try to attract philosophers and scientists to, you know, help France, you know. Uh, Rene Descartes was a Frenchman, after all. Okay. Um, so, you know, the like, so, so, so these scientific revolution and philosophers, you know, religiously they're somewhat diverse. Like, you know, um, Newton was a Unitarian. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we already discussed Descartes and mm-hmm. Spinoza mm-hmm. and Bacon. Mm-hmm. Um, but all these other guys, you know, they're all sorts of different things. Okay. So, you know. Okay, so what, what I mean, what advances come next? Um, so, notable advances, you know, uh, thanks to Vesalius, we have a lot of uh, advances in medicine and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, um, with physics advances, you know, this... And how, are the, how do the advances in medicine come about through experiments, experimenting on what... Human, bo- human bodies. bodies. Okay. Vesalius. Human bodies. Vesalius is like you know, you know maybe for a while there has been like you know they said oh it's immoral to experiment on a human body even right. if it's already deceased but mm-hmm. Vesalius is like you know you know maybe we can just save a few more lives if we you know try some actual experiments. Right. Okay. So Vesalius is the guy who discovers you know how what the heart actually does. Mm, okay. And you know stuff like that. Mm. Um, so you get to have to do that. You have to rip open somebody's chest while they're while the heart's still beating. He he performed like di- he just performed dissections on like uh, corpses and stuff. Mm, okay. And he could figure out okay, so the way this is designed, it seems like it's a pump. Yeah. You and if it's it. okay, that makes and sense. if it's connected to the veins, mm. then oh okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So there's advances in science, which is done through essentially dissecting bodies, right? Yeah. Okay, so what else is happening? Um, what else is happening? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the advances in uh, physics, you know, people are starting to, um, you know, maybe not make machines yet, but you start to see how people can come up with those ideas in the future. Hmm. So it starts to set up for that. And, you know, you get certain stuff like, you know, just, I don't know, like you like better cannons or whatever. So people are just making whatever scientific, whatever inventions they can come up with uh, using this information, you know. Mm-hmm. And some of it's more related directly to science, like beakers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And some of it, uh, you know, less so. Okay. Like cannons, but people are just coming up with all sorts of advanced. Mint, uh, due to this, you know, scientific revolution. Okay, stuff. When is this all occurring? Seventeen hundreds. So, so we're starting to wrap up during the sixteen hundreds. Oh, wrap up. Okay, that's the end of the scientific revolution. That's when sort of the groundwork is laid for all the future advances that we yeah. start to come very rapidly. And like, for example, the industrial revolution would yeah. ha- involve engineering advances, which are clearly um, tied into this this sort of inquiry. Okay. Yeah. All right, and uh, okay, so 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 it wraps up at the end of the 1600s, right? Begins beginning the 1500s mm-hmm. with Copernicus questioning the um, heliocentric model of the, the geocentric. Oh, model. geocentric. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. With Copernicus proposing a heliocentric model, yeah, and questioning the geocentric model, mm-hmm. and then it ends at the end of the 1600s with. Um, a, a flu- the, the beginnings of a flourishing of advances in various branches of science. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. 
And a lot of this is set up for the Enlightenment. You know, it's not quite as much overlap as, say, the Northern Renaissance and the Reformation, mm. but there, but you you can definitely see how this revolution, how the scientific revolution directly feeds into the Enlightenment. Okay. You know, uh, the very first uh, proper Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire, he was obsessed with Isaac Newton. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. All right, well, it's good to know. Do you have any final words you want to say, or do you want to wrap it up with that? Um, I do not have any final words. All right, great. That was a good discussion. Thank you, and we hope to see you all next time on the History Talks.